International donors pledge more than a billion dollars to help Afghanistan. We'll take a look at the future of the country. Hello, I'm Arnand Nader and this is The Heat. The United Nations hosted a high-level donor conference in Switzerland on Monday to help Afghanistan. Since the United States left, foreign aid has dried up and poverty has spiraled. We begin with this report from Julia Lubova in Geneva. The United Nations uh, says that the money it's uh, raising uh, would bring a vital relief to millions of Afghans who are facing suffering and insecurity. The United Nations chief uh, has called the situation in Afghanistan a looming catastrophe. Uh, the United Nations say that people in Afghanistan are des in a desperate need of a lifeline. This is what Antonio Guterres had to say about the pledge earlier. I urge you to support our flesh appeal for 606 million US dollars to get urgent assistance to 11 million people in the next four months. Today, we are announcing a 20 million US dollars allocation from the UN Central Emergency Response Fund to support the humanitarian operation in Afghanistan. And about a third of the money raised would be used by the World Food Programme. The United Nations say that food supplies in Afghanistan could run out by the end of this month and that the country is facing a drought and 14 million people there are on the brink of starvation. So uh, indeed, many countries have been pledging um, donations throughout uh, Monday. And uh, for example, the United States have pledged 64 million US dollars. Norway has pledged 11 and a half million dollars. And uh, neighboring countries, China and Pakistan, have also pledged their support. And uh, the World Health Organization, as well as the uh, office, uh, UN Office for Refugees, are also part of this uh, donation campaign. And, uh, but um, while the money has been, come in pledge, has been pledged, uh, uh, several donors, as well as the United Nations, they have expressed concerns about the Taliban rule. Uh, officials at the uh, uh, UN Office for Refugees uh, said that there are concerns that more people will be trying to seek refuge in neighboring countries. And already there are three and a half million Afghans who have been displaced and half a million uh, of, of them have been displaced this year alone. And um, the UN uh, uh, Human Rights uh, Chief, Michelle Bachelet, she also expressed concerns and she has warned of a new and perilous phase for Afghanistan. She accused the Taliban of a disconnect between their words and their actions. And Bachelet has cited various human rights violations in the country, as well as violations of uh, rights of women and girls. Now, well, donors such as Germany, for example, they said that the world has an obligation to help Afghanistan in this situation, but says that aid would come if human rights are respected. Julia Lubova, CGTN. Geneva. To discuss what's next for Afghanistan, let's bring in our panel. Pashtana Durrani is the founder and executive director of Learn Afghanistan. That's an organization that helps women get access to schools. Sabir Ibrahimi is a non-resident fellow at the Center for International Cooperation at New York University. Mohammad Shafiq Hamdam is a political analyst and was a senior advisor to former Afghan President Ashraf Ghani. And Victor Gao is a chair professor at Suchow University. Welcome to all of you. Uh, Mohammad Shafi Kamdam, let me start with you. The United States has left, the war is over, but as we just heard in that report, up to 14 million Afghans face severe hunger. You add to that the fact that medical supplies are running low in the country and there's a refugee crisis that gets worse every day. Um, what is the outlook for the country? We just heard that the United Nations has raised a billion dollars, that appeal that was made by the Secretary General. That's going to work in the short term, but what, it's, what about the long term future for the country? Uh, thanks so much, actually. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the major issue is that there was no Afghan representation in this uh, pledging conference. Uh, because we are still uh, lacking a uh, legitimate government to represent Afghanistan. So after 20 years, the sad news is that we do not have an official representation in such a major donor uh, pledging conference or international conference. That's very shameful. But, you know, on a positive side, I'm uh, thankful of all the donor community that they have pledged to uh, donate nearly $1 billion. Uh, but I think there is more to be done 
specifically for the United States. Of course, there is $64 million commitment from the United States. But let's not forget that, you know, Afghanistan is in a dire need of humanitarian assistance. Millions of people have been displaced within country, and million people have been forced to leave Afghanistan. Plus, Afghanistan is uh, disconnected with the entire world. And let's not forget that, you know, if the United States continue to support Afghanistan only through the money that they were pledging for war, which was more than $4 billion a year, even one portion of that money can help so many people. Uh, they, it can save many women, kids within Afghanistan uh, from starvation, from, you know, dying without medication. So I think this was on-time conference, and I'm optimistic and hopeful that, you know, uh, soon other countries jump in and assist uh, people in need. Sabir Ibrahimi, uh, the United States, as we heard, has just announced aid to the tune of $64 million. But the United States at the same time has also frozen $9.5 billion uh, in assets belonging to the Afghan uh, Central Bank. The White House has also stopped cash from being imported into Afghanistan. The IMF and the World Bank have also stopped access to funds uh, from Afghanistan. Um, what kind of impact is this going to have on the country in the longer term, the fact that there is no money available for the longer term and that we don't know when that's going to be available to it? Uh, well, so first thing that I think we need to discuss here is that we, have, uh, we don't have a government that is recognized by an international community in Kabul right now. So I think that's the reason that why the, the Afghanistan's assets, assets have been frozen. Um, uh, it's not that the United States just woke up one day and decided to freeze Afghanistan's assets. We have a government that is, um, uh, you know, consisted of people, uh, one third of them uh, on, on sanctions lists, United Nations, American and other lists. So, uh, however, the impact of this, I, I think it, it's, it's huge. Uh, right now, we're seeing a lot of Afghans running out of money, running out of cash, um, running out of food. There, there's a huge impact, but I think the Taliban knew that uh, this was coming, but they uh, still went ahead and, and announced this uh, uh, government that is not uh, true representative of Afghanistan. Right. Sabir, I get your point about the legitimacy of the government in Afghanistan, but should that be the major concern of uh, Western governments especially, seeing that, as we have been discussing, up to 14 million Afghans facing severe hunger, medical supplies running short, a refugee crisis on the country's borders. Shouldn't that be what they address right now? Uh, oh, yes, that should be what they should address right now, but I think they should be also looking into the legitimacy of the government. Um, the, the, the international community, in particular the West, I don't think that they should uh, uh, blindly write checks for the Taliban regime. Mm -hmm. I get your point, but, you know, they lost the war. They left. Uh, of course they lost the war and left, but, but why, do you, why do they have to now fund the, war, the, the Taliban regime? I don't understand. Okay, let's move on. Pashtana, great to have you with us on the show. Uh, the United States and its allies, like Germany, like NATO for that matter, they say one of the reasons for withholding funds is that there is no clarity on the policies that the... Uh, Taliban are going to adopt, especially those policies that are going to affect Afghan women, whether they'd have access to education, whether they'd have access to jobs. Um, and there are other concerns about human rights as well. Um, the Taliban has just announced that women will be allowed to go to university, but they're going to be separated by gender. Men go to one university, women go to another university. I mean, what do you make of the situation right now, and what are you expecting from the Taliban? Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I, I, I want to start with the fact when I was listening to the pledges that were made by all these uh, countries that have been in Afghanistan for, uh, for two decades, um, they're still doing the, the thing where you just keep on feeding the fish but you don't let them, uh, like, you know, know how to catch a fish mm -hmm. or know how, how fishing works. And that's the first concern that I have right now. Uh, you did it, uh, this in the past two decades. You legitimized Karzai. You legitimized uh, Ghani, their corrupt regimes. You gave them money. You gave the, you didn't have checks and balances. And now you're going to do again the same thing. And I don't care how much money they pledge. I, is it going to reach Afghan people? I don't think so. Uh, every time the UN, when, uh, whenever the money 
when he's pledged, the UN awards in and uh, brings in its people in the first class, uh, pays them good salaries. Uh, what reaches the people of Afghanistan? Uh, one. Um, one packet of flour, one packet of oil, and one packet of sugar. And then everybody is good about it, and it's poverty porn for the whole world to watch and feel good about it. Okay, we did something in Afghanistan. We've had a family for one or two months. I mean, like, you have to question these things. And I, I am so exhausted and frustrated with the fact that nobody questions it. You're welcoming money, but is the money going to reach the Afghan people? First, that's the concern. The second thing, when you talk about Afghan women and Afghan uh, and uh, these uh, governments talk about Afghan women. You brought them in. You legitimized the Doha deal. And now you are expecting them to act. You had the leverage back in the day, and you sold us out. And now you expect for them just to get to, uh, their act together? Why would they? Why should they? These are two questions that we should be uh, like, you know, seeking answers for. But at the same time, even right now, uh, all these countries have that um, leverage to use the aid and the fact that uh, the uh, recognition of the government is something that they they could include the ethnicities they could include the women in uh, let the women work let the girls get educated but at the same time uh, stop policing people right stop abusing human right. rights Pashnala, you know, simple... donor countries have recognized uh, the concerns that you've expressed whether the money will get to the people who need it the most. And what donor countries are saying right now, look, the way in which this money is going to be used and distributed in Afghanistan will bypass the government. It'll bypass the Taliban. It'll, work, it'll be distributed through uh, non-governmental organizations and other aid organizations yeah, that are working. It's again a project. It's oh. again a project. Why don't you see it? It's again going to be a project for an international uh, community, for international NGOs to feel good about themselves because they failed in the past two decades. They failed to connect with the rural areas and now they are going to buy in in their good graces with one uh, packet of flour. I don't see the whole thing. I do see the fact that, yes, people are starving. Uh, yes, I have communities that don't have money. Yes, Yes, there are people who are, need access to clean drinking water. Yes, there are refugees from Mazar Sharif, Jawzjan, Shibrigan, who are just crossing yeah. the border through spin. Right. Those are all legitimate reasons. But what uh, what post this pledge? What then? Are you continue? Uh, are you going to continue in your ways? Will you let the Afghans decide for themselves one, or will the world decide again for us? Uh, Mohammed that Shafiq, uh, doesn't Pashtun have? Uh, valid concerns though, about where this money will be uh, distributed and how it will be distributed, whether it will get to the right people. I mean, if we look at the track record, it hasn't been that good in Afghanistan, has it? I absolutely agree with Pashtada, what she said. Uh, and unfortunately, I was in a position to deal with the United Nations agencies in Afghanistan on behalf of the uh, uh, government of Afghanistan. Yeah. And my job was to work on one UN. Mm -hmm. uh, it was I think the most difficult job ever I have had, mm -hmm. uh, you know, besides that I had another responsibility, fighting corruption and being with NATO, fighting terrorism. And I found that very difficult to deal with the UN because, you know, the administrative costs of the UN agencies are mm -hmm. absolutely massive and high. It's around even up to 40 percent of the aids coming to Afghanistan will go to administrative Yeah, Mohammed Shafiq, let me, let me ask you this. Uh, you were a senior advisor to Ashraf Ghani when he was president, and reports are emerging right now that a a lot of the corruption that took place at the time took place while he was president. What was going on at the time? Certainly, that, there was a lot of corruption. Uh, you know, one of the reasons that um, I myself and several of my other colleagues, mm -hmm. uh, we quit. Uh, it was mainly because of corruption, but because I primarily work on the United Nations Affairs, mm -hmm. coordinating all these 20 UN agencies, mm -hmm. I also saw massive corruption within the UN agencies. Millions and millions of dollars, hundreds of millions have been lost, including Lotfa. You know, it was a UNDP project. They were managing or they were payroll for the police forces. And then there was massive waste. You know, we worked on a plan called One right. UN, which was including one, one voice, one program, one budget, and, okay. uh, of course, one office for the United Nations. And there was a lot of pushback from the UN agencies because they did not want to go by the priorities of the Afghan people and Afghan government. But instead, you know, there was projects that UN agency would take a project to save yes. a snow leopard 
world and, and Badakhshan, while UN agency had no you know, idea how to save a snow leopard. And then there was, you know, uh, we had a technical UN agency working in a ministry of education, but they yeah. were for industries. So there was a lot of mismanagement within the UN, including the Afghan government. Of course, there was massive corruption, as I yeah. mentioned before. My job was fighting corruption, and I noticed people in the cabinet, you know, in the palace, so many people uh, involved in corruption, but we do not have any immunity or we cannot provide immunity yeah. to the UN as well. They have to be accountable for billions of dollar aids wasted in Afghanistan under their watch. Okay, let me bring in, in Victor Gao into this conversation. Uh, Victor, great to see you. Victor joins us from Beijing. Uh, Victor, you can hear that there's a great deal of uncertainty, of anxiety about the future in Afghanistan. Uh, what is the extent of Chinese involvement in trying to get the country back on its feet in terms of aid? Um, I know that China, for instance, is, has been donating aid to the country. It's also been donating medical supplies as well. Absolutely. Uh, uh, first of all, there is a humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan, which may explode into one of the greatest uh, humanitarian catastrophe in recent time. And the second point is that uh, who should be uh, responsible for this? I think it should be the United States and all those NATO member states who fought this 20-year-old war in Afghanistan. They ran away without leaving behind them a viable framework for national reconciliation, for building up stability in Afghanistan. So if any finger needs to be pointed at anyone, it should be the United States and NATO countries. It should be a shame that they ran away without leaving behind them this viable framework. Now, thirdly, I think all countries need to pitch in in terms of dealing with this exploding crisis in Afghanistan. You mentioned China. China is one of the six neighboring countries of Afghanistan. Recently, there was a minister foreign ministerial meeting of these six uh, neighboring countries uh, who convened a digital meeting to talk about and talked about the humanitarian assistance to Afghanistan. China pledged not only in terms of money, but also in terms of food and the vaccine and other PPEs uh, to Afghanistan people. And China has all along been urging and advocating for peace and national reconciliation. I believe China will continue to do the same. There will be no solution of this humanitarian crisis if, for example, uh, efforts are not made to solve the uh, humanitarian crisis on the one hand, but also to continue to urge the Taliban leaders to really form a national reconciliation government and to respect the rights of the women, to protect the girls' right to go to school, because otherwise there will be huge disconnections between, between whatever that will happen in Afghanistan with the rest of the world. And we are seeing a kind of train out of collision course. And I'm really concerned about this exploding humanitarian mm. catastrophe, and I think we need to pitch in and do whatever we can do to help the Afghan people. Sabir Ibrahimi, Germany has already said that, look, the NATO countries are obligated, given their involvement in the military campaign over the last 20 years, they are obligated to help Afghanistan right now. So, I mean, there is some help forthcoming, but... Shouldn't that be a lot more um, rather than countries playing a blame game? Exactly. So right now, uh, Professor was Professor Richter was right about the human catastrophe and that something needs to be done. But I think uh, to pinpoint just the United States or NATO, I think it's a mistake. I think we have a shared responsibility. I'm not defending the NATO. I'm not defending the United States. But also, and, uh, and also, uh, we need to look at, at what's, what was going on over the last 20 years. Who was supporting who, um, and who actually pushed for a military victory in Afghanistan? The United States, the, the previous uh, Afghan government, which was corrupt, uh, given it was corrupt, given it had a lot of issues. It tried to make a peace deal with the Taliban, but the Taliban continued to push with a military victory, and that this is where we are right now. I think the Taliban also carry responsibility. The United States carry responsibility. The, the former government carry responsibility. Uh, it's a shared responsibility. Instead of uh, playing this blame game, we should get to work and help the Afghan people. Ms. Uh, Pashtana is right that it needs to be, uh, the aid needs to arrive to, to the people of Afghanistan. It, it should not go to the Afghan elite. It should not go to the Taliban. 
uh, uh, and it should not actually benefit uh, uh, anybody who's corrupt within the UN system or outside. Pashtana, given the role of women in Afghanistan under the Taliban, this was in the 90s, um, it seems that women in Afghanistan have not been intimidated by the Taliban. They've been holding demonstrations. They've been taking to the streets uh, to protest against what the Taliban is doing and fighting for their rights. Uh, but is there a risk that there could be a backlash, a violent backlash? I mean, like, there's always uh, that sort of, uh, like, you know, threat or risk with this, uh, something like this. But uh, thank God for Afghan women. I'm just going to say it on record. Thank God for Afghan women, for the brave Afghan women, for taking up the public spaces in a time where the whole world abandoned us. But they did what, whatever they needed to do. They came out when even the government, the in the most, the people who took pride in, like, you know, showing themselves that, oh, we are brave, left the country. But they came out and they took the streets and they were there. So that's something that we need to focus on and we need to celebrate and amplify those voices. That's the first thing. The second thing that, yeah, there could be a backlash, there could, there could be a risk, but as um, the professor said that if China is so invested in Afghanistan right now, maybe China should be focusing on women rights and uh, girls' rights and girls' education, because at the end of the day, China wants to have, like, you know, uh, China does have economic interest in Afghanistan. and. Yeah. At the, and for that, for that, if the 50% of the country is just confined to their uh, homes right. and they are not educated, there are no more high school uh, graduates, uh, we won't have any kind of economic stability. So for that, at least push for things that are uh, that are actual rights, that are yeah. universal rights. You know? yeah. How about that, Victor? Should uh, Beijing be sending word to the Taliban, look, you have to respect these rights? Absolutely. I think uh, China is doing the quiet diplomacy behind the scene. China fully respects Afghanistan sovereignty and territorial integrity and recognize that Taliban is the political force uh, uh, with sizable impact in Afghanistan. So we need to deal with uh, Taliban. I would say personally that the litmus test of what will become of Taliban is how they will treat uh, and deal with Afghan women and uh, whether they will respect girls' right to go to school. Because otherwise, if they prevent uh, uh, girls from going to school, if they prevent women from going to work, then they reveal the colors of what Taliban used to be about 20 years ago. And I would say human resources in Afghanistan are probably one of the most important resources in Afghanistan now. And that includes both men and women, boys and girls. So I think uh, uh, respecting Afghan women and girls is truly respecting Afghanistan as a country and Afghans as a nation. So we all need to work with Taliban leader to uh, uh, educate them or to persuade them to do the right thing, rather than, for example, regenerate into the old version of Taliban, which will really be condemned by the majority of the international community. Do the right thing. I would appeal to Taliban leaders to do the right thing, yeah. to put Afghanistan really onto a course of peace, stability and development. Uh, Mohammed Shafiq Hamdan, uh, much of Afghanistan's current situation, and we've been hearing this throughout the program, has been blamed on the very deep and pervasive corruption that we have seen in the country. And according to reports which are now emerging, it seems that a lot of that corruption was enabled by the United States in Afghanistan. According to New York Times reports, uh, American defense contractors were the main beneficiaries. But so were government officials in Afghanistan, so were people referred to as warlords in Afghanistan. And now there is a feeling in Afghanistan among some people, now that the Taliban have take, taken office, that, that they are now in power, that this could perhaps, it gives them some hope that this could perhaps bring corruption to an end. Let's listen to the views of one man in Afghanistan, a man on the street. Let's listen. When there is peace, there will be business. We are very happy that with the Islamic Emirates of Afghanistan, theft and bribery have come to an end. This is the Islamic system, and we are very proud of it. So, Mohammed Shafiq Hamdan, do you think at some point that the people who are responsible for this are going to be held accountable? Unfortunately not. Uh, I will advocate for it. Uh, you know, I will fight for it because, as you rightly said, one of the major causes of all the failures in Afghanistan was corruption, and it's not something secret. Cigar, this is a special institution established by the U.S. government, shows that hundreds of millions of dollars and even 
tens of billions have been wasted between the Afghan government and U.S. donors. And, you know, I will give you some quick examples. Like, you know, there has been, uh, you know, purchases for the Afghan security forces for um, ships. Uh, Afghanistan is a landlocked country, you know. There were, like, big boots paid for. And these boots are still parked here in Virginia, northern Virginia, since ever, you know. And there is massive corruption, massive waste of money uh, through the United States. But let's not forget that, you know, Afghans, we were also enabler. We were the spoiler. And we were more responsible because that was our land. That is, you know, that was our responsibility as a government and, and even public. But what happened, unfortunately, you know, this corruption has feed to the insecurity. It has feed to the uh, drugs. You know, last time when I was there in Afghanistan, yeah. you know, through the United Nations, I have had survey of 9,000 tons of uh, poppies in Afghanistan. It's massive. When Taliban left, it was 700 tons, and then it raised to 9,000 tons. Yeah. It was all because of corruption. So truly, people who has been accused of corruption, blamed of corruption, and there is so much evidence against them, they have to be brought to justice inside the United States, outside the United States, and within Afghanistan. Right, Sabir, there's such a fluid political situation in Afghanistan right now. We're hearing, for instance, that a lot of the warlords who helped the United States, uh, they were paid by the United States, they were paid vast sums of money to run the Taliban out of the country that was in the war, in t that started in 2001. Well, they are back right now, but they've switched their allegiance to the Taliban. Uh, it's it's expedient to do that right now. Um, I mean, we know about the situation to some extent in the capital, Kabul, but what about the rest of the country? Uh, the rest of the country is not, you know, different than it's Kabul. The only difference is that people in the rest of the country does not have uh, good access to social media. They cannot be heard. People in Kabul can be heard, can be watched. But I'm so afraid of people who are right now, for example, people in Panjshir are under besiege. They are surrounded, women, children. And like people in eastern Afghanistan and southern Afghanistan, especially women, their voice is not heard anymore. You know, they have been told to sit at home. And they're not people, girls like Kabul, that they have hundreds of cameras around them to talk and speak, but they are uh, shut up by a Taliban, you know, and unfortunately, the world community has not been reacting to that as well. I'm thankful okay. of all the aids coming. I hope more. Comes, okay, but this has to be with conditions yeah. for women's rights, right. and human rights. Pashtun, I've just got 30 seconds left. Uh, your organization, Learn Afghanistan, what is it doing right now? We are reaching out to 20 families every week. Uh, we reached to 55 uh, families uh, yesterday for refugees uh, in, in an undisclosed location. But at the same time, we are trying to build a network uh, with the healthcare workers and the students who yeah. are not allowed to go to school post grade six and yeah. we're trying to give them uh, education. So, yeah. Okay, and that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.